On Synchronicity by Carl Jung. It might seem appropriate to begin my exposition by defining the concept with which it deals, but I would rather approach the subject the other way and first give you a brief description of the facts which the concept of synchronicity is intended to cover. As its etymology shows, this term has something to do with time, or, to be more accurate, with a kind of simultaneity. Instead of simultaneity, we could also use the concept of a meaningful coincidence of two or more events where something other than the probability of chance is involved. A statistical, that is, a probable a concurrence of events, such as the duplication of cases found in hospitals, falls within the category of chance. Grouping of this kind can consist of any number of terms and still remain within the framework of the probable and rationally possible. Thus, for instance, someone chances to notice the number on his streetcar ticket. On arriving home, he receives a telephone call during which the same number is mentioned. In the evening, he buys a theater ticket that again has the same number. The three events form a chance grouping that, although not likely to occur often, nevertheless lies well within the framework of probability, owing to the frequency of each of its terms. I would like to recount from my own experience the following chance grouping, made up of no fewer than six terms. On April 1, 1949, I made a note in the morning of an inscription containing a figure that was half man and half fish. There was fish for lunch. Someone mentioned the custom of making an April fish of someone. In the afternoon, a former patient of mine, whom I had not seen for months, showed me some impressive pictures of fish. In the evening, I was shown a piece of embroidery with sea monsters and fishes on it. The next morning, I saw a former patient who was visiting me for the first time in ten years. She had dreamed of a large fish the night before. A few months later, when I was using this series for a larger work and had just finished writing it down, I walked over to a spot by the lake in front of the house where I had already been several times that morning. This time, a fish, a foot long, lay on the sea wall. Since no one else was present, I have no idea how the fish could have got there. When coincidences pile up in this way, one cannot help being impressed by them. For the greater the number of terms in such a series, or the more unusual its character, the more improbable it becomes. For reasons that I have mentioned elsewhere, elsewhere and will not discuss now, I assume that this was a chance grouping. It must be admitted, though, that it is more improbable than a mere duplication. In the above-mentioned case of the streetcar ticket, I said that the observer chanced to notice the number and retain it in his memory, which ordinarily he never would have done. This formed the basis for the series of chance events, but I do not know what caused him to notice the number. It seems to me that in judging such a series, a factor of uncertainty enters in at this point and requires attention. I have observed something similar in other cases, without, however, being able to draw any reliable conclusions. But it is sometimes difficult to avoid the impression that there is a sort of foreknowledge of the coming series of events. This feeling becomes irresistible when... As so frequently happens, one thinks one is about to meet an old friend in the street, only to find to one's disappointment that it is a stranger. On turning the next corner, one then runs into him in person. Cases of this kind occur in every conceivable form, and by no means infrequently, but after the first momentary astonishment, there is a rule quickly forgotten. Now the more the foreseen details of an event pile up, the more definite is the impression of an existing foreknowledge, and the more improbable does chance become. 
I remember the story of a student who's of a student friend whose father had promised him a trip to Spain if he passed his final examinations he passed his final examinations satisfactorily. My friend thereupon dreamed that he was walking through a Spanish city. The street led to a square where there was a Gothic cathedral. He then turned right around a corner into another street. There he was met by an elegant carriage drawn by two cream-colored horses. Then he woke up. He told us about the dream as we were sitting round a table drinking beer. Shortly afterward, having successfully passed the examinations, he went to Spain, and there, in one of the streets, he recognized the city of his dreams. He found the square and the cathedral, which exactly corresponded to the dream image. He wanted to go straight to the cathedral, but then remembered that in the dream he had turned right at the corner into another street. He was curious to find out whether his dream would be corroborated further. Hardly had he turned the corner when he saw in reality the carriage with the two cream-colored horses. The sentiment du déjà vu is based, as I have found in a number of cases, on a foreknowledge in dreams. But we saw that this foreknowledge can also occur in the waking state. In such cases, mere chance becomes highly improbable because the coincidence is known in advance. It thus loses its chance character, not only psychologically and subjectively, but objectively too, since the accumulation of details that coincide immeasurably increases the improbability of chance as a determining factor. For correct precognitions of death, Dirieux and Flammarion have computed probabilities ranging from 1 in 4 million to 1 in 8 million. So, in these cases, it would be inc incongruous to speak of chance happenings. It is rather a question of meaningful coincidences. Usually they are explained by precognition, in other words, foreknowledge. People also talk of clairvoyance, telepathy, etc., without, however, being able to explain what these faculties consist of or what means of transmission they use in order to render events distant in space and time accessible to our perception. All these ideas are mere names. They are not scientific concepts, which could be taken as statements of principle, for no one has yet succeeded in constructing a causal bridge between the elements making up a meaningful coincidence. Great credit is due to J. B. Rhine for having established a reliable basis for work in the vast field of these phenomena by his experiments in extrasensory perception, or ESP. He used a pack of 25 cards divided into five groups of five, each with its special sign, star, square, circle, cross, two wavy lines. The experiment was carried out as follows. In each series of experiments, the pack is laid out 800 times in such a way that the subject cannot see the cards. He is then asked to guess the cards as they are turned up. The probability of a correct answer is 1 in 5. The result, computed from very high figures, showed an average of 6.5 hits. The probability of a chance deviation of 1.5 amounts to only 1 in 250,000. Some individuals scored more than twice the probable number of hits. On one occasion, all 25 cards were guessed correctly, which gives a probability of 1 in... And it's a very large number, 298-023-223-876-953-125. The spatial distance between experimenter and subject was increased from a few yards to about 4,000 miles, with no effect on the result. A second type of experiment consisted in asking the subject to guess a series of cards that was still to be laid out in the near or more distant future. The time factor was increased from a few minutes to two weeks. 
the result of these experiments showed a probability of 1 in 400,000. In a third type of experiment, the subject had to try to influence the fall of mechanically thrown dice by wishing for a certain number. The results of this so-called psychokinetic PK experiment were the more positive, the more dice were used at a time. The result of the spatial experiment proves with tolerable certainty that the psyche can, to some extent, eliminate the space factor. The time experiment proves that the time factor, at any rate, in the dimension of the future, can become psychically relative. The experiment with dice proves that moving bodies, too, can be influenced psychically a result that could have been predicted from the psychic relativity of space and time. The energy postulate shows itself to be inapplicable to the Rhine experiments and thus rules out all ideas about the transmission of force. Equally, the law of causality does not hold, a fact that I pointed out 30 years ago. For we cannot conceive how a future event could bring about an event in the present, since for the time being there is no possibility whatever of a causal explanation, we must assume provisionally that improbable accidents of an acausal nature, that is, meaningful coincidences, have entered the picture. In considering these remarkable results, we must take into account a fact discovered by Rhine, namely that an each series of experiments, the first attempts yielded a better result than the later ones. The falling off in the number of hits scored was connected with the mood of the subject. An initial mood of faith and optimism makes for good results. Skepticism and resistance have the opposite effect, that is, they create an unfavorable disposition. As the energetic, and hence also the causal, approach to these experiments has shown itself to be inapplicable, it follows that the effective factor has the significance simply of a condition which makes it possible for the phenomena to occur, though it need not. According to Rhine's uh, results, we may nevertheless expect 6.5 hits instead of only 5. But it cannot be predicted in advance when the hit will come. Could we do so, we would be dealing with a law, and this would contradict the entire nature of the phenomenon. It has, as said, the improbable character of a lucky hit or accident that occurs with a more than mere probable frequency and as a rule dependent on a certain state of affectivity. This observation has been thoroughly confirmed, and it suggests that the psychic factor which modifies or even eliminates the principles underlying the physicist's picture, picture of the world is connected with the affective state of the subject. Although the phenomenology of the ESP and PK experiments could be considered enriched by further experiments of the kind described above, deeper investigation of its bases will have to concern itself with the nature of the affectivity involved. I have therefore directed my attention to certain observations and experiences which, I can fairly say, have forced themselves upon me during the course of my long medical practice. They have to do with spontaneous spontaneous, meaningful coincidences of so high a degree of improbability as to appear flatly unbelievable. I shall therefore describe to you only one case of this kind, simply to give an example characteristic of a whole category of phenomena. It makes no difference whether you refuse to believe this particular case or whether you dispose of it with an ad hoc explanation. I could tell you a great many such stories, which are in principle no more surprising or incredible than the irrefutable results arrived at by Rhine, and you would soon see that almost every case calls for its own explanation. 
but the causal explanation, the only possible one from the standpoint of natural science, breaks down owing to the psychic relativization of space and time, which together form the indispensable premises for the cause and effect relationship. My example concerns a young woman patient who, in spite of efforts made on both sides, proved to be psychologically inaccessible. The difficulty lay in the fact that she always knew better about everything. Her excellent education had provided her with a weapon ideally suited to this purpose, namely a highly polished Cartesian rationalism with an impeccably geometrical idea of reality. After several fruitless attempts to sweeten her rationalism with a somewhat more human understanding, I had to confide, er, confine myself to the hope that something unexpected and irrational would turn up, something that would burst the intellectual retort into which she had sealed herself. Well, I was sitting opposite her one day with my back to the window, listening to her flow of rhetoric. She had had an impressive dream the night before in which someone had given her a golden scarab, a costly piece of jewelry. While she was still telling me the dream, I heard something behind me gently tapping on the window. I turned round and saw that it was a fairly large flying insect that was knocking against the window pane from outside in the obvious effort to get into the dark room. It seemed to me very strange. I opened the window immediately and caught the insect in the air as it flew in. It was a scarabade beetle, or common rose chaffer, Catonia aurata, whose gold-green color most nearly resembles that of a golden scarab. I handed the beetle to my patient with the words, Here is your scarab. This experience punctured the desired hole in her rationalism and broke the ice of her intellectual resistance. The treatment could now be continued with satisfactory results. This story is meant only as a paradigm of the innumerable cases of meaningful coincidence that have been observed not only by me but by many others and recorded in large collections. They include everything that goes by the name of clairvoyance, telepathy, etc. from Swedenborg's well-attested vision of the Great Fire in Stockholm to the recent report by Air Marshal Sir Victor Goddard about the dream of an unknown officer which predicted the subsequent accident to Goddard's plane. This case was the subject of an English film, The Night My Number Came Up. All the phenomena I have mentioned can be grouped under three categories. 1. The coincidence of a psychic state in the observer with a simultaneous, objective, ex external event that corresponds to the psychic state or content, e.g. the scarab, where there is no evidence of a causal connection between the psychic state and the external event, and where, considering the psychic relativity of space and time, such a connection is not even conceivable. 2. The coincidence of a psychic state with a corresponding, more or less simultaneous, external event taking place outside the observer's field of perception, i.e. at a distance, and, the only, and only verifiable afterward, e.g. the Stockholm fire. The coincidence of a psychic state with a corresponding, not yet existent future event that is distant in time and can likewise only be verified afterward. In groups 2 and 3, the coinciding events are not yet present in the observer's field of perception, but have been anticipated in time insofar as they can only be verified afterward. For this reason, I call such events synchronistic, which is not to be confused with synchronous. Our survey of this wide field of experience would be incomplete if we failed to take into account the so-called mantic methods. Manticism lays claim, if not actually to producing synchronistic events, then at least to making them serve its ends. An example of this is the oracle method of the I Ching, which Dr. Helmut Wilhelm has described in detail. The concepts of time in the Book of Changes, in 
Joseph Campbell, ED, Papers from the Aranos Yearbooks, Bollingen Series 30, New York, 1954 to 1968, six volumes, volume three, originally a lecture at the 1951 Aranos Conference. And that is from the editors of the collected works. The I Ching presupposes that there is a synchronistic correspondence between the psychic state of the questioner and the answering hexagram. The hexagram is formed either by the random division of the 49 euro stocks or by the equally random throw of the three coins. The result of this method is incontestably very interesting, but so far as I can see, it does not provide any tool for an objective determination of the facts, that is to say a statistical evaluation, since the psychic state in question is much too indefinite and indefinable. The same holds true of the geomantic experiment, which is based on similar principles. We are in a somewhat more favorable situation when we turn to the astrological method, as it presupposes a meaningful coincidence of planetary aspects and positions with the character or the existing psychic state of the questioner. In the light of the most recent astrophysical research, astrological correspondence is probably not a matter of synchronicity, but very largely of a causal relationship. As Professor Max Knoll has demonstrated, Transformations of Science in Our Age, IBID, and that's from the editors of the collected work. The solar proton radiation is influenced to such degree by planetary conjunctions, oppositions, and quartile aspects that the appearance of magnetic storms can be predicted with a fair amount of probability. Relationships can be established between the curve of the Earth's magnetic disturbances and the mortality rate that confirms the unfavorable influence of conjunctions, oppositions, and quartile aspects, and the favorable influence of trine and sextile aspects. So it is probably a question here of a causal relationship, i.e. of a natural law, that excludes synchronicity or restricts it. At the same time, the zodiacal qualification of the houses, which plays a large part in the horoscope creates a complication in that the astrological zodiac, although agreeing with the calendar, does not coincide with the actual constellations themselves. These have shifted their positions by almost a whole platonic month as a result of the precession of the equinox equinoxes since the time when the spring point was in zero Aries about the beginning of our era. Therefore, anyone born in Aries today, according to the calendar, is actually born in Pisces. It is simply that his birth took place at a time which, for approximately 2,000 years, has been called Aries. Astrology presupposes that this time has a determining quality. It is possible that this quality, like the disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field, is connected with the seasonal fluctuations to which solar proton radiation is subject. It is therefore not beyond the realm of possibility that the, the zodiacal positions may also represent a causal factor. Although the psychological interpretation of horoscopes is still a very uncertain matter, there is nevertheless some prospect today of a causal explanation in conformity with natural law. Consequently, we are no longer justified in describing astrology as a mantic method. Astrology is in the process of becoming a science. But as there are still large areas of uncertainty, I decided some time ago to make a test and find out how far an accepted astrological tradition would stand up to statistical investigation. For this purpose, it would be necessary to select a definite and indisputable fact. My choice fell on marriage. Since antiquity, the traditional belief in regard to marriage has been that there is a conjunction of sun and moon in the horoscope of the marriage parents, that is, sun with an orbit of 8 degrees in the case of one partner, in 
conjunction with moon in the case of the other. A second equally old tradition takes moon conjunction moon as another marriage characteristic of like importance are the conjunctions of the ascendant with the large luminaries together with my co-worker mrs lillian frey roan i first proceeded to collect 180 marriages that is to say 360 horoscopes and compared the 50 most important aspects that might possibly be characteristic of marriage, namely the conjunctions and oppositions of Sun, Moon, Mars, and Venus. This, result, this resulted in a maximum of 10% for Sun and Moon. Sun, Mars, Moon. They have symbols on this page. Uh, okay. As Professor Marcus Fiers of Basel, who kindly went to the trumble, trouble of commu computing the probability of my result, informed me, my figure has a probability of 1 in 10,000. The opinion of several mathematical physicists whom I consulted about the significance of this figure is divided. Some find it considerable, others find it of questionable value. Our figure is inconclusive insomuch as a total of 360 horoscopes is far too small from a statistical point of view. While the aspects of these 180 marriages were being worked out statistically, our collection was enlarged, and when we had collected 220 more marriages, this batch was subjected to separate investigation. As on the first occasion, the material was evaluated just as it came in. It was not selected from any special point of view and was drawn from the most varied sources. Evaluation of this second batch yielded a maximum figure of 10.9% for moon conjunction moon. The probability of this figure is also about 1 in 10,000. Finally, 83 more marriages arrived, and these in turn were investigated separately. The result was maximum figure of 9.6% for moon conjunction ASC, which I believe is ascendant. The probability of this figure is approximately 1 in 3,000. One is immediately struck by the fact that the conjunctions are all moon conjunctions, which is in accord with astrological expectations. But the strange thing is that what has turned up here are the three basic positions of the horoscope, sun, moon, and ascendant. The probability of a concurrence of sun conjunction moon and moon conjunction moon amounts to 1 in 100 million. The con concurrence of the three moon conjunctions with sun, Venus... What is that? It's just a different symbol. I don't think it's... They haven't defined that symbol. All right, we'll just keep moving on. With Sun Ascendant has a probability of 1 in 3 times 10 to the 11th power. In other words, the improbability of its being due to mere chance is so enormous that we are forced to take into account the existence of some factor responsible for it. The three batches were so small that little or no theoretical significance can be attached to the individual probabilities of 1 in 10,000 and 1 in 3,000. Their concurrence, however, is so improbable that one cannot help assuming the existence of an impelling factor that produced this result. The possibility of there being a scientifically valid connection between astrological data and proton radiation cannot be held responsible for this, since the individual probabilities of 1 in 10,000 and 1 in 3,000 are too great for us to be able, with any degree of certainty, to view our result as other than mere chance. Besides, the maxima cancel each other out as soon as one divides up the marriages into a larger number of batches. 
it would require hundreds of thousands of marriage horoscopes to establish the statistical regularity of occurrences like the sun, moon, and ascendant conjunctions, and even then the result would be questionable. That anything so improbable as the turning up of the three classical moon conjunctions should occur at all, however, can only be explained either as the result of an intentional or unintentional fraud, or else is precisely such a meaningful coincidence, that is, as synchronicity. Although I was obliged to express doubt earlier about the mantic character of astrology, I am now forced as a result of my astrological experiment to recognize it again. The chance arrangement of the marriage horoscopes, which were simply piled on top of one another as they came in from the most diverse sources, and the equally fortuitous way they were divided into three unequal batches suited the sanguine expectations of the research workers and produced an overall picture that could scarcely have been improved upon from the standpoint of the astrological hypothesis. The success of the experiment is entirely in accord with Rhine's ESP results, which were also favorably affected by expectation hope, and faith. However, there was no definite expectation of any one result. Our selection of the 50 aspects is proof of this. After we got the result of the first batch, a slight expectation did exist that the sun conjunction moon would be confirmed, but we were disappointed. The second time, we made up for a larger batch from the newly added horoscopes in order to increase the element of certainty, but the result was moon conjunction moon. With the third batch, there was only a faint ex expectation that moon conjunction moon would be confirmed, but again, this was not the case. Whatever happened in this case would ad was admittedly a curiosity, apparently a unique instance of meaningful coincidence. If one is impressed by such things, one could call it a minor miracle. Today, however, we are obliged to view the miraculous in a somewhat different light. The Rhine experiments have demonstrated that space and time, and hence causality, are factors that can be eliminated, with the result that a-causal phenomena, otherwise called miracles, appear possible. All natural phenomena of this kind are unique and exceedingly curious combinations of chance held together by the common meaning of their parts to form an unmistakable whole although meaningful coincidences are infinitely varied in their phenomenology as a causal events they nevertheless form an element that is part of the scientific picture of the world causality is the way we explain the link between two successive events Synchronicity designates the parallelism of time and meaning between psychic and psychophysical events, which scientific knowledge so far has been unable to reduce to a common principle. The term explains nothing. It is simply formulates the occurrence of meaningful coincidences, which in themselves are chance happenings, but are so improbable that we must assume them to be based on some kind of principle or on some property of the empirical world. No reciprocal causal connection can be shown to obtain between parallel events, which is just what gives them their chance character. The only recognizable and demonstrable, demonstrable link between them is a common meaning or equivalence. The old theory of correspondence was based on the experience of such connections, a theory that reached its culminating point, and also its provisional end in Leibniz's idea of pre-established harmony, and was then replaced by causality. Synchronicity is a modern different differentiation of the obsolete concept of correspondence, sympathy, and harmony. It is based not on philosophical assumptions, but on empirical evidence and experimentation. Synchronistic phenomena prove the simultaneous occurrence of meaningful equivalences and heterogeneous 
causally unrelated processes. In other words, they prove that a content perceived by an observer can, at the same time, be represented by an outside event without any causal connection. From this, it follows either that the psyche cannot be localized in space, or that space is relative to the psyche. The same applies to the temporal determination of the psyche and the psychic relativity of time. I do not need to emphasize that the verification of these findings must have far-reaching consequences. In the short space of a lecture, I cannot, unfortunately, do more than give a very cursory sketch of the vast problem, problem of synchronicity. For those of you who would care to get into this question more deeply, I would mention that a more extensive work of mine is soon to be appear under the title Synchronicity, an A-causal connecting principle. It will be published together with a work by Professor W. Pauli in a book called The Interpretation of Nature and the Psyche.